hand over the microphone to, uh, to Amanda Luke, who will do our introductions. And to remind everyone, um, there will be a Q&A after this portion. And um, Amanda, take it away. Thank you, Fernando. Welcome, everyone. And welcome to Dr. Eduardo Herrera, who is Associate Professor of Ethnomusicology at Rutgers University. His research covers Argentine and Uruguayan avant-garde music, soccer chants as participatory music making, and music and post-coloniality in Latin America. His first book, Elite Art Worlds, Philanthropy, Latin Americanism, and Avant-Garde Music, explores the history of the Centro Latino Americano de Altos Estudios Musicales from 1962 to 1971 as a meeting point for local and transnational philanthropy, the framing of pan-regional discourses of Latin Americanism, and the aesthetics and desires of high modernity. In this and in his two current book projects, Dr. Herrera intertwines research into contemporary musical practices from Latin America, the Caribbean, and Latinx peoples in the United States from historical and ethnographic perspectives. His upcoming book projects are Sounding Fandom, Chanting, Masculinity, and Violence in Argentine Soccer Stadiums, and Soccer Sounds, Transnational Stories of the Beautiful Game. Dr. Herrera's talk this afternoon will draw on this research into soccer and sound, as well as the emotional contagion effect and the emotional effects of chanting in these public assemblies, as he speaks about the auditory ecology of soccer in Argentina. His lecture is titled, Effective Communities, Masculinities, and In-Group, Out-Group Dynamics in Argentine Soccer Chanting. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Eduardo Herrera. Thank you very much. Very nice to see those hands moving. Uh, and uh, thank you, Amanda, for the beautiful introduction. And uh, Barbara and Fernando, Amanda have done a fantastic job coordinating this, and, and David McDonald as well, and everybody in the faculty whose time I've used and abused. I really appreciate that. Um, I am going to share my screen so that I can give you a presentation that hopefully fits a, what is this, Friday afternoon. And uh, I'll keep it hopefully interesting to you. And um, I guess if you have any questions or if there's any problems uh, that I might be having with audio or something, just let me know through the chat or, or break into the microphone. Um, a, a quick disclaimer, this uh, talk uh, has a content that in, includes racist, homophobic and xenophobic language. There's misogyny and sexism and there's violence. So uh, uh, just one, um, just that heads up. Also, even though I think the volumes are as close as possible as level, some of the videos because of, you know, soccer and fandom suddenly exploding can get a little loud. So if you are, you know, close to your microphone or sorry, to your um, headphone volume, that would be best, but I'll let you know. So affective communities, masculinities and in-group, out-group dynamics. Boca Juniors is playing when Osiris changes. There is a vibrancy that can be felt, the shared emotion of a seductive obsession that takes over on match day. There is a large number of adults and children wearing jerseys, pants, shorts, scarves, or hats featuring the blue and yellow colors of the club. Some gather on the street, mostly men with beers or bottles of Fernet to be mixed with Coca-Cola. Others are inside neighborhood uh, cafes waiting for the match. I get the feeling of a small festivity in what otherwise would be a regular Saturday. This is one of the things fandoms at this scale achieve, a sense of the otherwise. It is not any day. A Boca Juniors match can change the feeling of this 3 million people city, 13 million if you include the entire metropolitan area. Most studies show that somewhere between 34 to 40% of soccer fans in Argentina follow Boca Juniors and estimates point to nearly 16.5 million fans of the team around the world. Five or six blocks away from the stadium La Bombonera, this is Boca Juniors home stadium, the streets of La Boca vibrate with the sound of drums and trumpets, exploding firecrackers and excited chants. The atmosphere is almost carnivalesque. I can smell the cordite. Someone near me lights a flare that the, and the fans start a chant based on the song Vasos Vacíos by the Argentine rock legends Los Fabulosos Cadillacs. 
The streets are simply not the same anymore. With a raised arm in a throwing movement with low, loose, loose wrists, hundreds of fans, mostly mains, ma males, sing loudly. Just for your reference, this is the original of the song, a fragment. That song sounds like Friday. In this chant, as in many others, both blood and heart are often used metonymically to underline the embodied and unchanging nature of emotions. The heart is a container that carries your love for the team, your blood, part of your heritage of who you are. Fandom circulates within an economy of emotion that creates a sense of unity among people that might never know each other personally an effective community of sorts. The fans' passionate singing begins by naming the neighborhood that hosts the team, La Boca. Most of the fans do not actually come from this neighborhood, but La Boca stands for grassroots, for El Pueblo, the people, especially when opposed to their main rivals, River Plate, a team associated with Barrio Norte, the upper class, money, and elitism. I should say that Boca Juniors and River Plate are perhaps the ones that have the more uh, a chance of fans that don't live in the neighborhood. Other than that, the majority of, of, of people kind of root for their neighborhood or their um, childhood neighborhood. The second and third phrases bring up core values of what Argentines called aguante. Having aguante means demonstrating courage, bravado, endurance, stoicism, and in some cases, fearlessness in physical confrontation. The repeated performance of fandom results in embodied signs of aguante, techniques of the body, reiterative gestures, ways of singing, tattoos, scars, and even drinking to the limit, they all give concrete materiality to fandom. Aguante is chanting and jumping during entire soccer matches, even in the face of adversity. Siempre te voy a seguir, I will always follow you. In bad times everywhere, good times are soon to come. And then, the naming of the other, Academia and Ciclón. We are not like them. An in-group, out-group dynamic is performed through moving and sounding in synchrony. And it is in this way that a sense of belonging is most commonly experienced. However, finding the original source of a chant or a discursive study of its lyrics leaves unexplored how these chants as sonic practice and social activity become meaningful beyond text and beyond genealogy. I believe that the ethnomusicological study of chants can expand our understanding of the potentials that participatory moving and sounding in synchrony have when people assemble. What I suggest here is to understand soccer chants as a plural performative social space. By producing and reproducing ideas about fandom, group identity, and particularly manhood, chanting as a collective action acts as a type of mass ritual. The repetitive and redundant performances elicit peer group validation of behaviors and emotions associated with a particular type of masculinity. What we will see as problematic later on is that this masculinity can be centered around transactional violence that uses as currency homophobia, racism, and xenophobia. But before we delve into that, let me share with you how chanting works with uh, and also the social organization of the stadium. First off, I use the word chant to describe collective synchronized utterances that range from liminal speech to more conventional songs. So some, some are really basically 
something you would short that you would say, and then other things are full on songs. One side of the spectrum shows little variation in tone, reduced intervallic range, and unremarkable rhythm organization. For instance, the assertion of historical dominance over another team by declaring them their sons. Hijos nuestros, hijos nuestros. On the opposite side of the spectrum are chants that involve entire verses, bridges, and chorus of songs with completely new lyrics, distinct melodic contours, and distinguishable rhythmic features, such as this one. I think this one might be one of the louder, so just in case. To my knowledge, all chants used in Argentina have a source in popular mass-mediated songs, commercial jingles, institutional and political advertisements, or soundtracks for TV shows. However, there seems to be little correlation between how successful a song might be and its potential to become a chant. On one hand, the recognizable Vasos Vacíos by Los Fabulosos Cadillacs, which we heard at the beginning, became Soy del Barrio de la Boca. On the other, the rather dreadful jingle, Bobby, Mi Buen Amigo, Bobby, My Good Friend, written for a 1981 TV commercial promoting road safety in the province of Buenos Aires is even more widespread. Written by Poggy Almendra and sung by a little kid not known only as Santiaguito, the song features a boy lamenting that his dog will not be coming to the summer vacation. The first verse and chorus shows the melodic material that was taken for the chants. Many still wonder why the dog was not allowed to join the summer trip, if he had a constant behavior that could be aligned with misbehaving, or what this song could possibly have to do with road safety. Still, the melody to this song is the entrance chant to most teams around the country. Here, for example, are the fans of Boca Juniors and then the fans from Racing de Avellaneda. It is worth pointing out that in Argentina, there are two parallel traditions of instrumental playing, similar to what happens in the stadium, all heavily influenced by Brazilian batucada. On the one hand, murgas associated with carnival and political manifestations of different, sorry, on the one hand, murgas associated with carnival. On the other, political manifestations of different kinds as examined most recently by Michael O'Brien. This is an example of a murga. And the example wasn't there. All right, I'll owe you that example. Um, on the other hand, the relatively impromptu drumming groups that appear in most political events. 
This event, for example, comes from last December during the inauguration of President Alberto Fernandez, when multiple union leaders celebrated with their own drum and brass sections. And it's funny putting together this presentation, it was so hard to realize, also to accept that this was just last December. I, I feel like this, I, I was there like years ago. It feels like seven years ago, but it, it's only last December, it hasn't even been a year. This overlap between Murgas, soccer, political, uh, political venues creates an indexicality between the political, the carnivalesque, and soccer. Chanting in Argentine stadiums beyond simple short phrases dates back at least to the 1910s when music from Carnival Murgas started being used for mass participatory singing. However, it was in the late 1940s and 50s when Argentine soccer fans became more heavily invested in using melodic borrowing for the practice of contrafacta, that is the substitution of a, new, uh, of a new text for the original one without considerable changes to the music. This happens, to be, to ha this happens at the same time that musical instruments, specifically the bombo or bass drum, enters the political arena as part of the populist political movement known as Peronism as docu documented by Adamowski and Buch. Chants from these decades are still part of the repertoire today and often have short texts, as in the case of the adaptation of Moliendo Café, a song by, uh, from 1958 by the Venezuelan Hugo Blanco, here performed by fans of Boca Juniors with the words, Dale Boca, and with one of the repetitions played in parallel thirds by the brass deck. I do have a, a, a very weak theory that I, I don't even write about yet, but I do feel that the more time passes, the, the more lyrics are used within the text, within the chants, right? Like the original chants are very much like this, very simple lyrics uh, or the earlier chants. Not always true, but, but it seems to be that way. But I was interested in how songs entered and left the repertoire. I asked fans how they go about learning new songs during the halftime of a third division, division match between Atlanta and Talleres de Remedio de Escalada in a particularly rainy Sunday. A man in his mid fifties responded, well, we've been singing the same songs for 30 years, so nobody has to learn them. I was skeptical. They all laughed, but somebody said, nah, nah, there are new songs sometimes, but, but not that often. About five minutes later, the second half begun and chanting started. There were about a thousand of us, but only 10 or 15 people were singing. One of my neighbors touched my arm and said, hey, hey, listen, that's actually a new chant, which seems to be quite coincidental. The chant did not last long and soon the crowd went back to singing more familiar tunes. After the match, I asked some of those who sang how they had learned the chant. All responded the same through YouTube or the team's Facebook page. Social media has become the main path for the dissemination of new chants among fans. Let me give you an example. On January 13, 2017, a new song by Puerto Rican artist Luis Fonsi featuring Daddy Yankee was released simultaneously as an audio track on music streaming services and as a video on YouTube. It went something like this. Despacito, with its catchy mix of cumbia and reggaeton, 
allowed Fonsi to quickly climb up the Latin pop charts. Even faster was the ascent that fans begun, uh, as fans began to create chants based on this song. About three weeks after the song's release and before the season had even started, fans of San Lorenzo del Magro had uploaded on YouTube their own version, which was being shared with subtitles so that other fans could easily learn it. So this is even before it was like a, the big summer hit. This was February. Here's uh, what they uploaded. Two days after this video was uploaded, YouTube user David Echeverri, actually Colombian, uploaded a tutorial for the trumpet part. By the time it was taken down, the video had nearly 409,000 views. And I was actually curious if this was a lot for trumpet players. So I, I went and did some, some silly digging and uh, this 490,000 views is more than all but the top five most viewed videos on the YouTube channel of the slightly more famous trumpet player, Wynton Marsalis. When the season finally started on March 11, fans of San Lorenzo. Oh, sorry, this is the lesson. Etc. When the season finally started on March 11, fans of San Lorenzo gathered in the corridors of the stadium around the core musicians and barra leaders to sing the song for the first time. that people still don't know it, but they're trying to get into it and then trying to learn it slowly. Um, shifting back to a more analytical perspective, I like to point out that the attention to the purely verbal component of terrace chanting has led to gaps in our understanding of the practice precisely as not speech. As a sonic practice and a social activity, chanting in soccer is a highly participatory performance tradition. And like presentational oriental, uh, oriented practices, the main goal of soccer chanting in Argentina is not quality of performance, but participation, sounding and moving together in synchrony. Within those who come to the stadium, there are clear roles, both in terms of fandom, music making, and internal hierarchies of the fan base. People that regularly attend matches are generally identified as hinchas or aficionados. Among them are the hinchada militante, who pride themselves on attending every match, regardless of weather conditions or the team performance. Their usual play in the place in the stadium is behind one of the goals where always standing, they will chant through the whole match. The most important subgroup among these militant fans often call themselves La Barra, a, team, a term I will use here, but they also call themselves La Hinchada, La Banda, Los Pibes, or La Pandilla. The barras in Argentina tend to create clientelistic networks with club executives, coaching staff, and even players. This gives them the privileges that most people don't have, such as early access to the stadium with drums, trumpets, trombones, giant banners, and even fireworks usually prohibited to regular audiences. And I always remember that uh, every, off, every so often I would arrive quite early to the stadium and I would bring a book or, or something along those lines just to, to keep myself busy while, while things started. 
And uh, the cops often gave me a hard time. They were like, why are you bringing this in? <laughs> I was for reading. I think they assumed I was going to like burn it or something or throw it to the referee. Um, so it, it's interesting that they just enter with these massive things. So here, for instance, we have um, the fans for uh, Vélez, Vélez Sarfield. These are the fans of Ferro setting up the, the flags and um, right, right before the, it's just early in the, in the match. Same here for Independiente. Internally, these barras have leaders. They're known as capos or jefes. Surrounding and protecting the capos are, uh, and second in the hierarchy, are the followers or la tropa, los seguidores. They're usually standing on those um, metal bars that protect from, from uh, uh, crushing uh, avalanches. Capos and their tropa benefit from increased prestige, neighborhood recognition, and the significant profits from endeavors almost always outside the law, such as resale of tickets, sales of pirate merchandise, uh, charging for public parking during matches, and even drug sales. Besides Aguante, Capos often show diplomatic and intimidating skills, which they use ne uh, to negotiate with club executives and the police, as well to mediate among the rest of the barras to organize them, diffuse them, and escalate the reactions. Capos are exceptionally talented at reading social cues to determine when it's a good moment for a compliment, a threat, or physical violence. The core the core of all synchronized sounding in the stadium comes from the middle of where the barras are located. There, one finds the central and most ubiquitous, ubiquitous instrument in Argentine soccer stadiums, the bombo con platillo, usually decorated with the colors and emblems of the team, as well as the name of the barras. Also central are the redoblante, seen here on uh, the middle, and the repique, uh, the game given to Brazilian uh, Repinique drum, which we can actually see here on the left and also there next to those bombos. Most clubs uh, have at least three trumpet players and include trombones fairly often. When a chant starts, all of these instruments gradually join in, adding to the overall cohesion of the chanting. So here's our, our, um, um, the moment when a, chart, uh, a chant is just starting. And there's actually two chants kind of competing for a second, and then one disappears and the other one settles. Successful chanting involves a very clear set of parameters, volume, and a wide sense of synchrony among the largest number of participants possible are valued highly. When the crowd is rhythmically out of sync, beyond what is usually acceptable, the snare or the repique drums will often play louder and with their piercing tone try to bring together the pulse to a wide but in sync state. Overall, cleverness in lyrics is appreciated even across fans from different teams. The vocal style used for singing emphasizes a round tone with sound placed in the back of the head with very little chest or throat involved, allowing prolonged and unamplified singing throughout the game. It goes something like, For chants with clear melodic contours, singing is expected to have a wide tuning and the high density of texture and timbre provides ideal cloaking of individual contributions that might not be too close to the expected pitches. In other words, if you're a poor singer, it doesn't matter, join. Nobody will criticize a neighbor fan for being out of tune since sociality is granted priority over the quality of sound. However, not chanting or chanting with little energy are interpreted as signs of not being a true fan. A final aspect of chanting involves body movement. Participatory sounding and moving in synchrony is the ultimate desired goal. The most common gesture involves a diagonally extended arm towards the sky 
with a back and forth movement of the forearm and a fairly loose wrist. Sometimes both arms might actually do it. Jumping up and down in pogo fashion is also fairly common. And it, is, and it sometimes leads to sideways bumping, particularly after goals. As William McNeil has shown, regular repetitive collective expressions, such as coordinated rhythmic movement, creates a kind of muscular bonding that endows groups with strong senses of solidarity. Think here of, of soldiers in training camp, for example, or even the movement that one does in different religious practices where everybody's doing the same movements. Um, all of these factors described here come together in a ritual-like practice of moving and sounding together in the stadium, which becomes a powerful, affective space and crucial in producing a collective and embodied sense of, sense of belonging. While I have focused here in how sounding and moving in synchrony connects fans intimately, one cannot assume that these connections are necessarily positive. In her 2004 article, Affective Economies, Sarah Ahmed starts by asking, how do emotions work to align some su subjects with some others and against other others? How do emotions move between bodies? But what if we were to understand that emotions don't move between bodies, but are experienced as collective or shared affect? Is there such a thing as an affective we, an affective community, or is the body the boundary of emotion, limiting, it, uh, limiting us to share as similar to those of others, but never exactly the same. Social psychologists and evolutionary anthropologists have demonstrated that humans and other primates have an innate capacity for basic emotional contagion. That is a tendency to automatically mimic and synchronize facial expressions, vocalizations, postures and movements with those of another person's and consequently to converge emotionally. This is something that most anthropologists have always noticed, right? Cultural anthropologists and, and probably every parent has noticed that the baby kind of reacts to your face and you even react to the baby's face. However, it is also recognized that emotional mimicry is related to the understanding of an emotion in context and is involved, oh, Sorry, the next one. Emotional mimicry. Uh, is related to the understanding of an emotion in context and it's involved in regulating one's relation with the other person. In other words, we are more likely to mimic the emotional reactions of in-group members than those of out-group members. End quote. In that way, thinking of effective communities provides not only for a space, a space for shared emotions, but ways in which groups provide us shared ways to properly interpret those emotions. Research on the circulation of emotion in sports, and particularly soccer, has often focused on mega events such as the World Cup. However, I argue that at least in Argentina, collective and shared emotions experienced by national victories and defeats are metonymic of a larger identification, nation. While the national team might be experienced as an authentic representation of the identity nation, an intermediary in a sense of my own identity identifying with the nation, for many fans, local team fandom is at the core. There is no intermediary. Fandom is a way of being, of participating and living as a member of a community one built around intense feelings of social cohesion, belonging, and bonding. It is, perhaps, it is perhaps because of this that fandom often becomes a space for projecting collective anxieties and performing what Suarez Orozco has called a structural scapegoating of the other as means of defining one's group. What this means in practical terms is that chanting in the stadium is one of the many ways in which the feeling of in-group and out-group, self and other, is mobilized. Problematically, this often involves an othering based on offensive and hurtful discriminatory language, taking advantage of vulnerabilities. Take, for instance, the following chant. He 
here. Well, actually, that's a good one too, so I'll just leave it. In these examples, the word negro and puto are used to sonically attack the adversaries, creating discriminatory discursive regimes. Uh, I, I should clarify, in Spanish, that word is not like the N-word in English. It doesn't have that strong of a connotation. It's still being used here as an offensive term. Uh, but uh, for instance, my dad, they called him El Negro, and it was not, it, it, it's complicated. It's a very problematic term of endearment, which I'll mention in a moment. Uh, but it's just not simple. It's just not the same as in the U.S. As the fans chant, as the fans chant, their intensity increases in these two words, giving them an accent that underlines their importance for those singing. In Argentina, the word negro works as an indexical cluster that groups darkest, darker skin color, indigeneity associated to migrants, a generic term for non-whites, and a generic term for low socioeconomic status. Needless to say, constructions of race in Argentina are very different from those in the United States, and there is much more fluidity in racial identifications that intersect with class, with education, and place of origin. The mention here of neighboring Bolivia and Paraguay is related to the migrants from these countries who often occupy precarious sectors of society and are frequently blamed for increasing social and economic problems such as crime and unemployment. Now, we have to understand Buenos Aires has a large sector, sector of its population that identify as being white and of European descent and has imagined a dangerous other with lesser claims to the nation. It is in that space that the, word, that the use of the word negro has functioned both as a problematic term of endearment and a, as a constitutive, constitutive counter race in opposition to a white middle class. Those who use it often argue that there is no racial component involved in its utterance as an offense, but instead it acts as a shorthand for behaviors they associate with bad taste, vulgarity, and bad attitude. However, of course, like with the word puto, race, class, and gender often are inseparable in practice from judgments and hierarchies of taste and claims of appropriateness. These words are being read and pronounced in an accusatory manner used to demean, to stigmatize, and to reduce the recipient. And they both become meaningful within serious histories of racism and sexual discrimination. While racist and anti-Semitic chants have gradually, but relatively efficiently made it out of the stadium, contemporary chants often involve sonic attacks to the opposing teams, players, and fans that are androcentric, heteronormative, and homophobic, as you might have noticed throughout the examples of this presentation. With few exceptions, soccer authorities have not made strong commitments to eradicate these kinds of attacks from the stadium. It has been that lack of official intervention, which has encouraged community leaders and grassroots organizations to begin questioning problematic aspects of stadium behavior. So there's been, you know, Twitter-based campaigns. There's been several uh, uh, attempts to incorporate uh, the rainbow within the, the slogans of different clubs. Uh, um, feminist groups that have uh, asked for a foot uh, for a soccer without violence, and uh, even um, children group because there's been also uh, an increased number of of this kind of fandom in children's soccer and the soccer-like chanting in other sports. In late November 2019, fans of the soccer team Gimnasia y Esgrima La Plata uploaded a video titled, Yo No Quiero Cantar Eso, I Don't Want to Sing That, in which they invite fans not to sing the misogynist, homophobic, and violent songs heard in soccer fields and in other sporting events that have adopted soccer-like chanting practices. Here's the video, and I should say that when the chant mentions pincha, it is referring to the fans of the biggest rival team, Estudiantes de la Plata. They're, they self-identify as La Pincha. Está re 
golpeada. La puta del pincha está como loca, no entiende nada. Está requebrada. Que lo vengan a ver. Eso no es un arquero. Es una puta de cabaret. Lo del pincha son todos putos. Yo no quiero cantar. Yo no quiero no quiero cantar. Yo no quiero cantar esto. Yo no quiero que le escuche esto. Yo no quiero cantar 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 esto. Este terremoto es hacerle frente a las canciones misóginas y homofóbicas de la cancha. Queremos a gimnasia unido y libre de violencia. By adding statistics to the video, this group makes explicit con the connection between chance and femicide, sex trafficking, and violence against members of the LGBTQIA community. The group received both praises and also criticisms and threats on social media. So here are some of the ones I, I, I took some screenshots, but uh, the first one says, seriously, stop busting balls. These songs have been sung forever. And just now you come and bust balls with this patriarchy, patriarchy misogyny, homophobia, etc. Oh my God. The next one says, uh, do you want to do something productive for the LGBT collective? Go to the embassy of Iran and protest the country that executes homosexuals. This one well, starts with uh, what imbeciles. And the next one says, ah, the day they take folklore out of soccer, nobody will ever go to the field again. Stop the bollocks complain. And if you don't like what it's being sung in stadiums, well, don't go anymore. Much more, than profound, much more than profound, simple delivery of lyrics, the sharing of a specific repertoire by gathered bodies becomes an important embodied practice and basis for powerful shared affective connections. Not at all, not all necessarily positive. Chanting remains a refuge for misogyny, homophobia, normalization of gender violence, racism, anti-Semitism, and other discriminatory practices. As we all take more aggressive stances towards social justice so that they become the, north, the, the norm, it is worth questioning if further attention and regulation of chanting practices in soccer stadiums could lead toward positive social values, towards a more inclusive, progressive, and caring masculinity. Some positive aspects of the masculinities that emerge in Argentine stadiums remain heavily understudied. For instance, I suspect that Argentine fans would wield similar results to a pan-European online poll of approximately 2,000 soccer fans, which revealed that ne nearly 75% had hugged or kissed total strangers at a football match, and 66% had cried in public. Take, for instance, the next video, one of the few lucky opportunities I had to fully capture the reaction to a goal after having met many of the people around me. I can tell you that at least half of the demonstrations of affection that you see in this video are happening among men who met about an hour ago, or that solely have relationships among them because of being fans of Independiente. <laughs> If the stadium is a space where, yes, if the stadium is a space where plural bodies name and in doing so bring into being certain kinds of masculinities that we often associate with violence and discrimination, 
They also may include ways of expressing feelings of joy, despair, and affection that might give sense to a broader and much more inclusive masculinity. This study sheds important light on how chanting functions as a type of collective action akin to mass ritual, and how synchronized sounding and moving in public spaces, specifically in the stadium, can potentially relate to similar collective performances in political rallies, religious activities, and protest movements. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs> I like seeing the hand. I appreciate that. That's very sweet. Thank you. Thank you very much, Eduardo. And scrolling up. I know that there's all sorts of uh, different uh, constituencies here, and I want to encourage anybody to ask any questions. There's no, there's no silly question here, and uh, I know that many of you will be, you know, curious about methods, issues, theory, anything. All right. Give them a second to start organizing themselves. And I see Stella uh, raising her hand. I encourage you to use the raise hand on the on the participants. But Stella, you want to ask a question? Yeah, I was curious um, about if you know anything about like connections between like um, leftist people's movements in Argentina um, within sports. I noticed you mentioned um, Bolivia and and how like there was a lot of derogatory racist comments about Bolivia and and then you know knowing that up until a year ago um, it was Bolivia was governed by Evo Morales, an indigenous man, and how that relates to this. So I was just wondering if you know a little more about that. Yeah, that's, a, that's a, a, a complex and fascinating question. You're basically pointing at the holy grail of soccer studies in Argentina, which is finding a direct connection between Peronism or the new versions of you know, leftist populist thinking of some sort and soccer fans. And they're all kind of weak to some degree and strong in another degree. And I'll tell you what I mean. They're weak in the sense that they're not the same, right? Like they're separate and, and no one club stands or one fan group stands for a political group. But there's also a very important aspect to consider that when those political groups, and it's not just unions, but when a politician wants to make a protest because, you know, just to create, you know, disorder and, and kind of make a point, they will call the leaders of these groups to be kind of like the, 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 the music makers and also the troublemakers. I, when I mentioned that these people engage often in, in illegal activities, I was not, not exaggerating. And so, so there is that connection. Um, the Bolivia connection, which I understand why you're pointing it at the left, um, Argentina was in a similar situation in terms of a, of a progressive president with uh, Nestor Kirchner and then after with Cristina Fernandez, uh, then went into this kind of very dark period with uh, Mauricio Macri, which who was a, a, a kind of like revoking a lot of the of the social uh, changes, social reform that had taken place before. And now we're back with Alberto Fernandez, which is kind of like the left in Argentina. The problem is that this left that emerged in the la la late 1990s and early 2000s in Latin America has somehow disappointed the youth. So, so there's, there seems to be like a, 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 a sense that everybody en ended up doing some sort of leftist neoliberalism. Uh, or socially aware neoliberalism or something. So from, from Chavez to, uh, to Morales, to uh, Michelet in Chile, to, to uh, you know, the, the, the Kirchner and Fernandez in, in Argentina, there was a feeling that they, they had the chance and they didn't take it and that we're back in a pendulum towards, towards the right. Um, but again, the connection is, is really about money. They, they get paid to go and, and, and help to this protest. So a lot of them just do it because of that. Um, so yeah, you're pointing at the Holy Grail, but I haven't been able to point to find the connection. Thank you. I don't know if Emma Diederich, if you have your hand up or if you thought was just an error. That's an applause. I was clapping. I think I used the wrong one. Okay, that's <laughs> Thank fine. Thank you. I appreciate that too, Emma. How so are you? you? I'm doing well. Thank you. Uh, Excellent uh, presentation. <laughs> Thanks. Julianne and then uh, Alicia. Hi, yes, thank you so much for your talk. Um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about kind of the last point you made about um, fans and this kind of homosocial affectionate behavior. 
Um, I wonder if you can talk a little bit more about how you read that as an inclusive behavior, because I could also, I also, it, from what you said, it seems like it could also be read as a sort of gatekeeping of physical affection within heterosexist structures. So mm -hmm. I just, if you could elaborate a little more. Thank you. That's that's a very good question. So when I started this research, uh, a lot of the the presentations I were I was giving were just simply they were downers. I mean, really, you ended up and you were like, wow, this is just terrible. And uh, I, I was really trying to understand in which sense, what is it that I actually feel should happen here, right? I was asking myself that question. And due to mistakes of mine during field work, you know, and then things along those lines, I often ended up in the wrong side of the stadium where these fans are not, right? And those fans, are, those spaces are much more family friendly. Uh, because I'll, I'll divide the, the conversation for a second. Those spaces are much more family friendly. And I know that there's an attempt to imitate this kind of environment, but people are afraid of the pushing, the shoving. Actually, people are not afraid of the, of the language. You, you still see, you know, seven-year-olds and eight-year-olds screaming these things, just, just like that. That's a different problem. But they do not like the, the possibility of violence. The fact that these barras actually are basically the security, because the cops don't really get in if they don't have to. They, they allow the barras to control, the leaders to control this. Uh, and so they really want that out of the stadium so that the space can be much more family friendly. Uh, and by that means older people, younger people, really, that, that's what I mean. Uh, women are fairly welcome in, in, in these barra sections, and there's many tending towards the young side. And actually, homosexuality is not outwardly, uh, you know, uh, sanctioned or, or not, no, sorry, going against, right? Like there's several fans that are actually homosexual themselves, not openly gay and still chant these things, which is very, contra you know, but, and also they chant things about this word negro, which really is a discriminatory term rooted in class, but with a bunch of racist and, 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 uh, and uh, xenophobic uh, baggage. They themselves would probably be labeled negros by others but they're using it still as, a, as, a, as an attack. So it's a kind of a, like a weird situation in that sense. Uh, but what I do feel is that that masculinity that has been presented never allows for that uh, homosocial space of affection, feeling, crying, hugging, that is separate from sexuality as practiced, right? That it has more to do with what kind of, of, what kind of man manifests fandom and in which ways. So, so there is space, I think, in, in this type of masculinity that, uh, that is opened by the positive corners of, of this practice for any sexual orientation, really, not just that, but all others. Uh, and finally, I will say, um, I just lost my train of thought. I wanted to point something out to, to do. Well, I'll come back to it because I, I forgot for a second. But, but yes, that's what I, I, I would answer to that. Thank you. And, and, and I think Alicia? Hi, thank you so much for your talk, Eduardo. I'm excited to see what comes of uh, the rest of your analysis for this research. I kind of wanted to ask along the lines of what Julianne just, just asked, um, uh, this awesome sort of continuum of intimacies um, even Moya Bailey's idea of homo latency um, might be useful here, homo erotics, homo sociality, um, and the sort of gradations of um, affection that can occur. Um, even uh, Luis Manuel Garcia's um, work on affect theory um, in the club space might translate well to this sort of sports arena space. Um, and so, Julianne beat me to the punch, which is good. We're, we're on the same vibe. Um, and I would just, uh, uh, um, I think the men's studies, um, um, close look at the homosociality and the various ways of same gender connectivity might really like tease out some of where you left us um, here in the paper. Um, and Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. And, and that actually, that all connected me with what I wanted to say, and I kind of left uh, outside, but I appreciate that. And I do think that, uh, so here's, here's the issue that 
that positive change that could potentially happen in in this in this space that it's already homosexual homo homosocial in a particular way, right? That it already allows for expressions that do not happen outside the stadium, right? That defy the 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 the, the concept of the macho outside the stadium, which is not the only kind of masculinity. Don't take me wrong. In Latin America, there's many types of masculinity. We the the, the more controversial and 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 criticized, of course, is machismo as a, as a particular way. There, there's many, but. Uh, but this one is kind of the most problematic, of course. But there are already those spaces. So what I take as reference, and going back to Julianne here, is Europe. What happened in Europe when they were dealing with this problem? And the, the key word there is the carnivalesque, right? The stadium as a space of subversion for the norms actually became enabler or was being enabling certain attitudes, bad and good. In Europe, what they did was they shut down that option. They shut it down by putting seats, by, by uh, uh, transmitting through the PA what songs were going to be sung, uh, by banning people for a life, which is fine, actually, by the way. I think that some people should be banned for life from the stadium. Uh, by raising the prices also because they were, they imagined this, there, there's a class reading of this that imagines violence to be low class, which is not necessarily true. There's, there's anybody could be engaged in the violence that they're being critical, but they take with low class. So in Europe, it's very difficult to go to the stadium, and it became a TV sport, which actually I've, I've been thinking for one of, for for the book that is more theoretical, that idea of the collective affect uh, or the shared affect, which are different. Uh, my cat is saying hi. Um, collective affect or shared affect, as can it happen? over a distance, right? Like television puts us in a, in a weird, the, the mass mediation of, of soccer puts us in a distance, can, can that actually happen or not? And, and there's work on that as well. So, so I, what I want is to find a space in which, or, or support a space like the one they're supporting in, in Gimnasia La Plata, this, this people that I showed in the last video of Yo No Canto Mas, is kind of uh, uh, continuing with the carnivalesque, removing the hate speech basically. Right, um, that that's kind of what I'm looking for here, and and the the projects I want to support. Really, that's that's where I'm headed with this. This is the people that I want to support. Pravina had her hand up next. Oh, Pravina, yeah. Yeah, uh, thank you very much for your talk. Uh, reminds me, you know, saudades do Brasil, right? We're all stuck here in the in the U.S. We can't travel. I have a question that. Um, I'll hear about the actual violence, not the sung violence, but the actual violence that happened, especially during the World Cup, especially the, you know, what happened in France that made the national, you know, international news. My question is, it, but there's also violence in uh, these local uh, team, among these local teams in Brazil, for example. Um, is there a relationship between chants that are more violent, we're gonna kill them, and fans then getting riled up and getting excited and going out and actually attacking the opponent, opponent uh, fans. I mean, is there a relationship between the song getting all excited and the actual act of violence against the opposing fans? Ravina, you're almost like my plant because you asked an excellent question for what I want to say, which is this talk, I wanted to provide enough context to the people that haven't read the article I already published in Ethnomusicology, which actually deals with this, but also provide new contents for the people that actually have read it. But what you're talking about, I, I actually am very interested in. And in fact, this is the second reason why it was a great question. I, I use a lot of the work that David McDonald has written in terms of violence and in, in the ways that this collective practice is associated with masculinity create frameworks of interpretation, right? For these acts to make sense. So, the, so in, in the media, I know in Brazil is the same as in Argentina, the media presents these fans when they get into a fight or when even deaths happen, I mean, there's been, Last year, fortunately, there was only one death that I can think of. Uh, one death, I think so, yeah. Uh, but um, all of this violence, the media presented as, as some sort of irrational, you know, this violent people. And they don't understand that this violence is transactional, that there's an economy of violence taking place and that there's a way, like, like a framework to interpret that violence that is being set by the champion. So it's not, it's very difficult to say the chant is inciting it, no. But the chant creates the the uh, the uh, the means to interpret both emotionally and and rationally with a different rationality acts of violence, 
So when these fans uh, engage in some of these practices, they might think, oh, we are um, role-playing, right? When I scream like this, blah, blah, I'm just role-playing the, 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 the fan. The, and that might be th true to, a, to, to an extent, right? Cathartic, going to the stadium and just yelling this and, you know, it's cathartic. But to some degree also, there's a, there's a dissonance, a cognitive dissonance that is taking place, right? When I sing, I will kill these other people because this team is my life, at what, at what point do I start not blurring those distinctions and, and really living? Because that experience feels very authentic. And I'm using that word very specifically because it's, it's a complicated word, but the experience feels authentic. You feel part of the group because you're moving together, you're sounding together, the whole floor, you're all moving it together. So you're accomplishing something outside of, of word discourse as a collective. So when you go out, you feel as a collective and somebody gets attacked, 15, jump in, right? Like there's no, not even thinking, it's, 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 it's that mentality. So I talk about de-individuation. Uh, mu music scholars, uh, we've all focused on community building in, in uh, music, but the other side of that coin is de-individuation. Music also reduces our capacity to understand, or certain musics, uh, reduce our, our capacity to understand ourselves as individuals and puts us as, as group. Uh, it's not necessarily good or bad. <laughs> it just depends on the situation. But you do lose a sense of individuality in certain in certain aspects, especially participatory music making. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for that question. I see John's hand. Yes. So I'm wondering uh, among the inches, you know, the the serious guys there, uh, with the drums and the trumpets and the banners and all that. Uh, I'm curious to what extent they actually pay attention to the game. And it occurs to me that uh, the activities going on uh, in that in that subset uh, could actually in some ways be more engrossing uh, than the game itself and could uh, start to assume, well, to kind of take a priority uh, over what would appear to be the reason why they're at the stadium. Maybe yeah. there's a different reason why they're at the stadium. Yeah, so the, you, you bring up a, a great point. First, you're right. Sometimes a match is really bad. And people are more interested in chanting than in the match. But even when there's good matches going on and the team is either you know, not doing well or doing really well, there's still fans that don't even look at, the, at, the, at, the, at what's happening because their role in that space is to, to rile up the crowd. And they feel that they are accomplishing something as the, the 12th player. Like the name of the Boca Barra is very dicey. It, it says, La, meaning the, the 12th jersey in the field. And uh, so there's people that, it's almost like the goalkeeper, right? The goalkeeper is back there waiting and not doing much, but it's their, it's their role to be back there getting bored. They cannot just come and see how things are going. So for these people, there, a lot of them, this is their role. They need to do that. There's a second aspect. There's people that are there for other reasons. There's people that are there for security of the capos because there's internal violence that might happen and also security of the of the fans these people don't allow anybody to be robbed because they're watching and if somebody gets robbed no that doesn't happen here uh, or if somebody tries to sell drugs that it's not them <laughs> that doesn't happen there either right so so there's a little bit of that as well um but you're absolutely right right that there's there's this aspect of going to the stadium that it's already cool without the match and it has to be a celebratory experience, and it ha it, it it looks to be that. Uh, and and you see that the most with with teams that are losing, the teams that are don't do well. Um, and and there's interesting here the connection with with uh, emotion is important to realize that euphoric moments are not as powerful as dysphoric. Dysphoric is that the the word like bad moments, like horrible experiences, mark as much much more as groups than the, the positive ones. Dysphoria is stronger than euphoria in the sense of creating those, those, those uh, connections. So it's, I don't think it's surprising what, what, uh, what happens. Thank you, thank you, John, and thank you for coming. I saw uh, Dan hand, Dan's hand and Emma's hand. And I don't know if, if uh, Provina has another question or, or just hasn't lowered her hand. Emma, you were first, go ahead. Hi, Daniel. <laughs> My question is, is kind of light. It's about the terminology and how are you going to touch it in the book 
or in articles, uh, that terminology is very dense and, uh, and very uh, current to be appropriate to be currently discussing it and put some uh, insights on the meanings, you know, and, and the terminology I'm talking about is negro, puto, etc. Um, can you talk a little bit about my, uh, a little bit more about that? On what was your approach? Where, uh, what kind of resources, if any, and uh, and what's out there for for trying to understand? You know how these words are used in context. Yeah. Thank you. And and this actually is is good. I, I know that there's students here, and it's an interesting question because there are several aspects that enter in in that spectrum. First is. Am I comfortable doing research with people that are chanting this, right? And as a researcher, you uh, and those who are in training right now, that's some, a question that you need to consider. How comfortable am I in a space in which I'm going to encounter misogyny or that I'm going to encounter you know, racism? Or, uh, and to what degree is my role as a researcher and as ethnographer to uh, you know, respond, act, interfere, or, or not? Um, and so that was the first decision that I had to make, right? Like, how do I feel about this? How do I feel that I'm with people that some have ongoing uh, investigations for murder? Like I was hanging out with those people, not hanging out, but I was with them uh, or, or having a beer or something. And, and But I, I, uh, I was waiting those options. And then when coming back, how do I deal with the language, like what you're saying that they're using? And, and to me, more difficult was how do I deal with the translation of that language? because it becomes even harsher in English if you don't understand how it's being used locally. Uh, and, and I basically made a call at some point and said, I'm going to tackle this up front so that the impact of how this is problematic, it, it comes across. Because to me, the main problem is the attitude of, no, nah, that's not how we mean it. And that forgets that words are like snowballs, right? That they. They are multivalent. They add meaning and more meaning and more meaning. So the fact that my dad was being called Negro, sure, that's great. But it does not, uh, uh, you know, the fact that it ha can be used as a, as a, a mean of endear endearment doesn't mean, doesn't remove the fact that it's also used for, you know, inappropriately uh, addressing uh, uh, people as, as, an as an offense, right? So uh, I think that it's important to notice that because that has been the argument. And for larger associations, I think things like FIFA, uh, they've, they've only been responsive when people are blunt, saying, this is what people are saying. Are you allowing them to say that, right? Uh, they were very, when, when, when the chants, anti-Semitic chants have been very harshly stopped, when they were stopped, uh, it was because there was no escaping from the language they were using, right? They were making references to, to soap and, and uh, making uh, gas noises. So FIFA and the Argentinian just jumped in and stopped it. Why don't they stop this? Why don't they stop the homophobia? Why don't they stop it? Uh, because it means something else. So, so that was my decision. I, I kind of took that decision. I'm gonna do this. I will announce before we start, you know, I, I use language that is harsh in the presentation, but even with my undergrads, I tell them we, we need to face this because uh, you know, we need to have, you know, we, a, a strong stance. This is a matter of, of, of a space that needs to be changed. So thank you for that. There's another thing that the two books, uh, I'm working on two books, one that was put on hold because of COVID that is the more ethnographic and more theoretical, which is this paper is part of that. And, and then one, the, the, the uh, soccer sounds, uh, transnational stories of the beautiful game. I, I don't know, yeah, that, that's what it is. Uh, in which I actually look, it's much more historical and looks at different cases around the world. So, so South African uh, World Cup, the racist understanding or the racialized understanding of the Vuvuzela, not, not racist, but the racialized understanding of the Vuvuzela and what it meant to be noisy, right? And, and the, the race implications of that. I look at, at the Mexican homophobic uh, chant, that same word being used in Mexico. I used, uh, uh, I look at uh, Egypt and Chile in which uh, Stella's question is actually much easier to answer because there's very clear fans that were part of the Arab Spring and that were part of the Chile Chilean protest last year. They're, like the fans went out with their shirts to do that, right? So in those cases, it's very clear. Uh, with, the, with our women's national team, uh, the, the, the equal pay chant, right? Um, so, so same there, I, I want to point out that the use of chants for, for uh, 
and sound in, in sports for a more positive note, I guess. Thank you for that. And uh, I, I missed the introduction. As, I, as you can see, actually, I still have the same Volkswagen that you ride on. So I'm sitting on it. So I've been driving around as I have been listening to the talk as I have had to do some errands. But uh, I, I, I missed the beginning. How do you, if you said it, how do you come about? Is it your passion for sports? Is it, uh, because this is very powerful what you're doing. Uh, coming from uh, uh, anthropology, folklore, ethnomusicologists to all of those fields to actually encapsulate this terminology that is so political, social, et cetera, and to put it in writing. I think you're doing a great service uh, to us as Latino to look at ourselves and actually say, hey, you know, put it out there. Let be offensive. Let oh. people disagree and let us look at ourselves and see what are we doing with this? Is this where we want to be defined? Are we okay with it? Or wow, I didn't mean it that way. Then fix it, then change it, oh. you know, or just embrace it and, and become it, you know, but this is very powerful. So thank you. Thank you, thank you, Emma and and uh, uh, Fernando. I do want a, a, the copy of this recording so I can save that and, and listen to it when I'm feeling sad. I want to be like, this is what I need. That that's the pep talk I need. Uh, okay. Thank you, Emma, Daniel, and uh, I, I know Barbara was also raising. So Daniel and then Barbara. Eduardo, thank you very much for your talk. I, I've enjoyed it as, enjoyed it as well. It's very rich and a lot a lot to think about. Um, a natural point of comparison for us in the United States is. Uh, uh, Colin Kaepernick and the eventual influence of Black Lives Matter on uh, professional sports in um, in this country. And you you mentioned something at some point when you were talking about the dissemination of the chants. That if I if I heard you correctly, that do the do the clubs themselves have uh, Facebook pages that are that are governed by by whom by by the owners by the administration of the club or. That's a fascinating question because it's not an easy to answer. And by the way, Emma, I just realized I didn't answer your question and I'll come back to that, the, the why did I get in this? But uh, Daniel, those pages uh, are run mostly by the, uh, the fan associations, right? Okay. But uh, there's multiple fans associations. I mostly talk about that core group of fans and they do also have you know, their own pages and they have their own name and everything like that. But those fans receive money from the executives, right? That, that's where I didn't explain that fully, but the clientelistic networks is those fans receive money that when possible pays for, for, for travel when they have to play in another, in another place uh, that might pay for the buses or whatever. Uh, they also get free tickets, which they often resell and they still go in the, the stadium. They just tell the cops to let them in, but they often resell. So it also makes money for them. Uh, so, so, uh, they do this, but they're also making money. So, so the production of these videos and what what these things are coming out, it's it's a uh, it's still part of a, of a money making uh, endeavor. And and honestly, I've I've seen a couple of people that I don't think they're really for the fandom. There, there's people that are there for for the business, especially the drug part, if if it's if it's profitable. Okay. Well, my reason for asking you is that uh, you you you're wanting to find a way to support the, the positive aspects of this tradition and remove the hate speech, if I understand you correctly. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. Support that effort. Uh, and you showed us the example of the folks who are, uh, who are themselves there in Argentina trying to work toward those same aims. Um, I'm wondering where the power lies to, to, to determine um, you know, what makes the content of the chants. Um, you know, is you know, at a certain point, the NFL owners here are like, okay, um, uh, obviously we're on the wrong side of this issue. We're, we're you know, people are turning away. We're getting lower ratings, um, you know, yeah. and then also, of course, in more broadly speaking, in American sports, we have Le LeBron James is another you know, players themselves who hold a certain amount of cachet and power to uh, work toward change. So, are are there players that are part of this? Or, or, do, do the owner are the owners cognizant of the, the do they actually promote um, these, these associations and their Facebook pages or whatever the hate speech and, and to sort of look the other way or uh, how much is it, is it sanctioned and potentially controlled? All right, no, this is this is great. So first of all, you you made me think of something that I hadn't considered, 
But uh, this is where I'm headed, I guess, with, with what I want to do now or next. Uh, my plan this uh, spring, which didn't happen, was working with this group of uh, gimnasia, the, 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 the ones that were doing the Jono Canto Esto. And uh, I've been trying to, basically the money I had to go was you know, institutional money that now I want to give them so that they can do their work and, and, and promote that, that particular work. And you ask about that structure of where the power is. And I think that's what needs to happen, which is basically fragment that power because that concentrated power in those barras is what creates the problem, right? And these groups that, that you're mentioning and you're wondering, hey, so who's doing what? They're always on the margins. They're acting from the margins, but it's really, if we achieve that fragmenting of, of the barras, that we might have multiple places of, of different kinds of power and, 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 and not this hierarchy, because it's very much a, a hierarchy, it's a pyramid of mm -hmm. like, these are the barras and, and they will decide what happens with anything else. Uh, so, and those barras are the ones that threatened th those particular fans that were asking for n stopping those chanting, right? Like they're part of the, of the people that threatened them. And uh, there's another group in which uh, uh, there was a woman in the, in the club Atlanta who was in, in just uh, very much committed to this cause and at some point stopped because they were breaking her windows and, and her car was being, you know, keyed and, and things like that. Um, then the other part, and, and when your connection with Kaepernick and with um, LeBron and, and other players, I haven't noticed such a presence from the players in Argentina. Uh, uh, it's been more through, through the fandom. They've been very quiet and, the, and the, the club executives as well, very, very quiet. However, one of the, one of the chapters I, I have in this uh, book talks about the, the rise of a neoliberal tolerance and this refers to a, a moment in which it's more expensive to not be to it's more expensive to not be tolerant than to be tolerant. And that moment, you jump and start, you know, stopping these things from happening. Uh, so that happened with Mexico in the U.S. and uh, you know, Me Mexico team playing in the U.S. and uh, and in Mexico, which was they were being first of all they were being charged ten thousand dollars and they just paid it. But at some point, they started. Uh, threatening that with a third warning, they would not have any audience. And that's, that's millions of dollars. Mm -hmm. And immediately the, 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 the problem started stopping. The, the soccer players would stop and, and ask the audience to stop singing, right? Like they, they, the fans themselves would turn because they knew this was problematic. So, so uh, in, in that sense, this kind of neoliberal uh, uh, understanding of what tolerance is and, and what the cost of being tolerant or intolerant is becomes kind of relevant. Uh, thank you for, for that question, especially for the fragmenting. I need to think more about that idea, but that explosion of power. Uh, hey, Can I uh, interrupt real quick? Yes. So I'm gonna just say, Dave, you're gonna be the last question because I think some of us do have to go on to other spaces after 5 p.m. But I also wanna invite everyone to come back in about what is traditional in, in the colloquium series that we have always done, but don't do it now because of COVID, as we would probably go to Nick's and have a drink, have a bite to eat and engage you with many more questions. I have four of my own that I would like to ask you and some comments as well, but I will always refer to the floor. So Dave, you will have the last question and then we'll take a break. I'll stay in this room. If you wanna just go get your drink and come back, that's great, but in about 15, 20 minutes, We'll resume with a cocktail hour. Sounds delicious. I can share recipes. Thank you, Eduardo. Um, something just came to mind in your, your response to Daniel's great question, and that is um, the history of segregation and Alabama football. And what this history shows is that the legendary coach of Alabama football, Bear Bryant at the time, um, came out progressively in support of desegregation, not because that was in his heart so much as he was having a hard time recruiting and he, and he wanted to improve the chances of his football team winning championships by including black players. And he felt limited in his ability to, to win unless he could recruit black players to the University of Alabama. And that is what ultimately changed his policy and then became the, the catalyst for um, change in Alabama is the football fans and boosters wanted their team to win games and that is what compelled their political change. So like you said, the cost of intolerance 
And in this case, I would, I would love it if you kind of looked into that history of intolerance in college football for as a great example for it was the losing football games which caused them to rethink their ideas on segregation, which to me is just mind blowing. Yeah, and, and and since you mentioned it, also our history in colleges of, of quote unquote mascots, and the cost of removing or not removing a mascot in terms of alumni uh, donations, right? Like one of the reasons that those things don't change is because alumni will pull out. So, but at some point, there's a breaking point in the budget, right? Like like that. that right. Very much, uh, uh, As we learned at Illinois with Chief Alliance, mm -hmm. it was all, the chief was only removed when it became more expensive to keep it around. Yep. It was not. It was not made. It was not a decision made on on principles, but on exactly. On thank you, Eduardo. Thank you, and thank you so much, everybody that came. And uh, hopefully, you can stay and have a, a, a drink. Uh, I, I really enjoyed talking, and even though it's weird in, in, in Zoom, I felt like a lot of, of uh, I don't know, good energy. Yeah, if you can, either turn your cameras on or use the reaction emoticons. Thank you very much for the wonderful talk. And